Welcome to the Age of Vision radio show with your host, Wani Clark. We stand together and accept we now live in a world transformed by the nuclear industry. We expose and confront the intentional neglect and disregard for life on our planet by atomic energy. Consider social engineering programs who view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action to save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Every voice matters. Our actions matter. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good afternoon. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I am very excited to have with us Mr. Harvey Wasserman, and he is a historian, an activist, uh, and actually a talk show host, and uh, and I would say an activist in the anti-nuclear movement, or the new truther movement, as I call it. He is also the author of a new book called The People's Spiral of U.S. History. And Harvey, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate your time here. My pleasure. Yeah. So I want to ask you, uh, because I have this particular interest in the nuclear denial, because I am completely dumbfounded. I was like most Americans. I came in, I thought our government was handling nuclear waste. I thought it was no problem. After Fukushima, I even believed Barack Obama when he said everything was fine. And I only found out like a year afterwards that things weren't fine. And then I started getting involved in... After about two years, I ended up with this radio podcast, and I started doing further research, and I've discovered that there's almost like a blanket nuclear denial about the harm that nuclear causes the planet. And in fact, in the climate collapse conversation, nobody discusses the effects of nuclear contamination on the climate. There's barely a part, no conversations on that. So... So that's one thing, and then the other part of that is there is very little youth involved in this. Most of everybody that we talk to are older people. I myself am 64. Almost all the activists are older people. Do you have any, you're a talk show radio host, you're out there, you've been an activist for a long time. Do you have any feel for, A, why that is and how we can break that model? Well, the nuclear power issue uh, is a generational thing. It came came um, to life here in the U.S. the No Nukes movement uh, in the '70s, and you know it's a lot to learn. It's complicated, and um, uh, we're really down to um, not fighting uh, new nukes. So the idea that they're going to build new nukes is is ridiculous. It's it's just not going to happen. Uh, they're too expensive. They're too slow to build. And um, uh, they're, they're too complicated. Uh, it's just, you know, so I, of course, oppose new nukes, uh, but I don't spend much time on it because these guys are just uh, blowing smoke, as it were. Uh, and so the, the, the younger generation doesn't really relate to um, the nuclear issue uh, the way they do the, to global warming. Yeah, but this and is the, my the point. Climate issue. The global warming, I really believe that global, you can't tell me that 80 years of nuclear contamination and ongoing contamination is not affecting the climate collapse. I mean, there is no way that nuclear contamination is not affecting the biology of this planet. And so the, oh, the fact uh, that it's not even part of the discussion and I understand that the younger people weren't part of the implementation of nuclear power plants, but, you know, we do have these SMRs that they're trying to sell us, which are, again, a, a, a dead end. SMRs are the small modular reactors, which the right. Navy and the Army are definitely building. They're they're putting them up, and there is one being built in Utah, so that they are doing them. They're They're moving full steam ahead. But the conversation about... The, every time we talk about nuclear, most of the time it's about the cost and how it's breaking the bank. And 
in fact, that's the conversation I got into with the Natural Resource Defense Fund when they were lobbying along with the nuclear industry to keep their leaking nuclear power plants open so that the NRDC's goal of closing down coal could be accomplished. Like they they were completely exclusive to the idea that it is part of the contamination of our planet. I mean, we have massive amounts of uh, birth defects, autoimmune diseases, diabetes, schizophrenia, all these things are caused by nuclear contamination. And yet you go to your doctor, they will never tell you that. Right. and But, you know, you've also got other things coming in uh, like 5G, uh, GMOs, uh, uh, and things like that. So the, the problem that we have with the nuclear issue is that uh, uh, what we the the number one um, item, the number one agenda item that we have is to shut the operating reactors, and so um, you know there's 96 uh, commercial right. reactors that are licensed to operate in the in the United States, and all but one of them is more than 30 years old. So right. uh, you know, and it, even the one that's not 30 years old, Watts Bar. Uh, they they were building for 30 years, so uh, but there right. effectively there are no new nuclear plants under construction, um, except for Volkdol in, in uh, Georgia, which is uh, you know a catastrophe in every way, shape, and form, and uh, is going to cost them close to 30 billion dollars. And we did shut the two, uh, we stopped the two in South Carolina, uh, so for it's it's very unglamorous and really hard to get your head around uh, to uh, try and shut uh, operating reactors. In fact, I have a problem here in California where uh, there's two reactors at Diablo Canyon, and the deal was cut to shut them in 24 and 25. Uh, and, but I'm getting, you know, we're, we're, I have there's a group uh, here in Southern California, also, you know, like an AARP group, I mean, uh, older people generally, um, that are trying to shut these two reactors, but we we always went into people. I even had a, a former U.S. senator tell me that they're they've already been shut. I mean, she was completely wrong. So wow. um, it, it's 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 uh, treading water to get people um, uh, focused on closing down operating reactors, um, and then you have these clowns running around saying that you know nuclear power fights global warming. And then it's a zero emission, which is a complete lie. Um, uh, but uh, it, it's hard to combat that. And it's, it's hard. It's not sexy. It's, it's hard to really get people excited about it the way we were excited about uh, stopping uh, nuclear construction, which we were very successful in doing. Right. I mean, when we when um, I was living on a, a communal farm in Western Massachusetts in 1973, when they came in to build two reactors nearby. And now that's where we coined the phrase "no nukes," and um, uh, you know we were able to get a movement, and we had people getting de- uh, arrested and mass demonstrations right, and all that, that stuff. And uh, at the time, Richard Nixon uh, said there'd be a thousand nuclear power plants in the United States by the year 2000. So in the year 2000, there were 104. Uh, so we were pretty successful. Uh, uh, unfortunately, of course, all it takes is one nuclear plant right. to wipe out um, millions of people and uh, trillions of dollars, and we're in that position now. The, the react the, the plants that we couldn't stop, including Diablo Canyon, um, you know, are positioned to uh, inflict apocalyptic damage. That's true. And anybody who, um, uh, for example, the, uh, and if you really want to see a graphic. Um, uh, exposition of what can happen uh, in, with the nuclear industry. People should see the um, feature uh, series uh, on Chernobyl yeah. uh, that was run. I think it was HBO did it. I mean, it's incredibly powerful. Yeah. Uh, very, very widely watched, by the way. Right. And um, so we live in terror of these com- continuing reactors, but it's hard to get people. First of all, it's very, very hard to shut. An existing power plant. Well, I don't know what, what yours what, is like at Diablo Canyon, but the one up here in Columbia Generating Station sits on the Hanford Reservation, 
and they discovered the Physicians for Social Responsibility did their own study because there had always been rumored that it was sitting on an active earthquake fault. <clears throat> Turns out it is. It's surrounded by active earthquake faults, and it's only 11 miles away from Hanford, which means if we even have a mild nuclear mel meltdown caused by an earthquake, Hanford is going to have to be evacuated, and Tom Carpenter from Hanford Challenge Think, agreed with me that we could potentially have one of those tanks explode and we'd have a fire for 750,000 years that would contaminate the entire northern hemisphere. Now, when I found that out, I got active with a group up here in the northwest to try to close down a Columbia generating station only to find out that it's a consortium of 50, I think 57 utility companies. I mean, you, it's, you can't, they all have to agree to close it down, and they're all pro-nuclear, and so it's, you, you can't even get in to see the Bonneville Power Station, which is the people that are kind of overseeing the consortium. They really literally will not even make appointments with you. So it's, it's a really difficult challenge, as you say. To, how, how, did, how did Diablo Canyon get decided to get closed down? if you don't mind bringing our listeners up to speed on that one. Well, what happened is that um, there was a, um, first of all, Diablo Canyon is in California. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we had 10,000 people arrested there. Oh. You still, uh, you know, you still commonly meet activists here uh, of a certain age who were arrested at Diablo Canyon, including me. I was arrested there. I didn't live in California at the time, but, I was arrested at Diablo in 1984. I spent three lovely nights in the San Luis Obispo County Jail. And, uh, you know, it was a rite of passage um, in the 70s and 80s to get arrested at Diablo. Um, and uh, the, the the bottom line is that uh, they're losing money there. It's, uh, and many, that's the one thing that's really uh, uh, working in our favor. I, I can't, I start to talk, as you just did, about the dangers of Diablo, which is surrounded by earthquake faults. It's 45 yeah. miles from the San, San Andreas. Right. There was just a um, 7.0 at uh, uh, China Lake, which is less than 200 miles from San Luis Obispo. Oh, okay. I mean, if, if uh, the, the, um, that quake had hit at Avila Beach uh, instead of uh, uh, Ridgecrest, um, you know, L.A. would be a smoldering ruin. And the fact is that you know, you can talk about Hanford, but um, uh, if Diablo goes, God forbid, yeah. uh, the cloud comes into Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, that's it. But uh, I hear over. what you're saying. It's really more of the way to get them closed down is to talk about the cost. I know it. At, I have an activist friend, Nancy Newell, up there in Portland. You know, they passed a law here in Oregon that said uh, Columbia Generating Station has to stay in the black. It can't run at a negative, and it's losing five hundred million dollars a year. We're subsidizing it. Yeah, so is the Apple Canyon, and um, and it's getting worse because uh, what's happening now is that the uh, the high operating maintenance costs are combined with the deterioration, physical deterioration of the reactors. So. It gets worse and worse. And meanwhile, one of the great, I, I have to, almost have to call it a miracle of our our age, is the incredible um, uh, technological leaps in renewable energy. I mean, um, you know, when we first started in the 70s, people would say, well, if you're not going to have nuclear, where are you going to get the energy? And we'd say, well, uh, wind and solar. I mean, we're really talking through our hats. And uh, the technology has just exploded. Right. Uh, it, it has exceeded all expectations to the point now where um, a new wind, it's cheaper to build a new wind or solar facility than to continue to operate a nuclear plant. And this is straight out flat economics. So Diablo, just a, a court filing, um, uh, is clearly losing. Uh, the, well, let's put it this way. The, um, the electricity produced by Diablo is coming in on an annual, well, in, in this year, in 2019, um, uh, the, the electricity produced by the ABO is going to cost more than $520 million uh, over market. Wow. So, I mean, it, it's just uh, staggering. So that's, but now I, I circulated a petition. Uh, we had a group here asking the governor, our great liberal governor, Gavin, Gavin Newsom, 
to merely inspect the reactors. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we know we know right, we know you that. don't want to yeah embr- I find that embr- embrittled and yeah and um, uh, it's cracked it's deferred maintenance was has become PG&E's trademark um, they can't deal with their nuclear waste they got the seismic issue <clears throat> and um, uh, we can't get I got I, the, among the people who signed it are Mimi Kennedy Jane Fonda Lily Tomlin uh, mm-hmm. Francis Fisher Jody Evans uh, Lila Garrett I mean it's uh, and, um, uh, Martin Sheen at, at Begley at Asner, you know Graham Nash. I mean, uh, an insanely powerful group of ho- Hollywood stars. <clears throat> we got zero response from the governor. He hasn't even he hasn't even responded to the petition, and we can't get any coverage from the media. It's astounding. It is astounding. So those... nobody wants nobody wants to talk about the uh, you know the the dangers. Yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about. Is the nuclear yeah. denial? It's like. Even somebody like a liberal governor of California, as soon as he gets into office, he clicks his heels and says, Sig Heil and does whatever the nuclear industry wants. And, you know, even though he's opposed to uh, Donald Trump, you know, who, I mean, was it a year or a year and a half ago? I think it was last year he signed it. It was recently as last year. He signed an executive order stating that the United States is going to support nuclear energy, that we will bail out these nuclear facilities. Right. And so... Well, a big, a big part of the problem... <laughs> excuse me. Sure. A big part of the problem is, I hate to say it, uh, the unions. <laughs> you know, I'm a union man. I'm a union supporter all my life. But the uh, workforce at the nuclear plants, including Diablo, is unionized. And so you have a thousand guys, uh, people, mostly men, uh, working at these reactors, and uh, they don't want to shut them. There's a thousand high-paying jobs. You say, well, get the get the jobs in uh, renewables, but the jobs in renewables are not unionized, and they're they're much lower paying, and they're not um, secure, hmm. at least in the eyes of the, uh, of the union guys. So you have a very very powerful union lobby uh, demanding uh, that these, and they, they also have pension fund investments here that uh, that are uh, are affected if the reactor shut. So, oh, really? That, that's yeah. That's a big problem. Uh, it's a it's a core problem in shunning reactors. And so, but what happened here, this being California, mm-hmm. and um, uh, and all the issues <laughs> do have some resonance. I mean, people understand earthquakes here, um, and uh, nobody believes that that Diablo or any other nuclear plant could withstand an earthquake. Um, and that Diablo, of course, the, the cloud goes. Right into L.A. Right. So um, I'm from L.A. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So um, we're we're looking here at uh, um, sufficient um, uh, critical mass to uh, force, and then you got you, you got PG&E. And PG&E, you know, is a, a horrible nightmare. They burned down Northern California. They blew up a uh, uh, San Bruno. You know, they're yeah. they're a criminal uh, corporate, literally. Figurative, literally a, a criminal corporation. Right. Was, uh, they were convicted of a number of felonies uh, r- uh, related to the San Bruno fire of 2010, which killed eight people. <clears throat> and now, you know, this nightmare up in Northern California, and uh, and they're bankrupt. So um, all that allowed us, to, uh, the uh, Friends of the Earth and uh, other uh, 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 A4NR and so on, to go in and force a negotiation. <clears throat> With the the town, uh, the union, uh, the company, uh, the, the state, uh, to, to uh, you know shut them down in 2025 when their license expires. Now there are also some uh, state regulations uh, that they were able to finesse by cutting this deal. <clears throat> so had they not cut this deal, PG&E, they, the, the state agencies would have shut them down uh, earlier, and they wow. should have shut them down. You know we're not happy about that. And Gavin was on a uh, uh, one of the state agencies that allowed them to avoid doing an environmental impact review, <clears throat> and you know, and, and people yelled at him, and he got a bug up his behind about this, and so he he doesn't like to talk about the Apple. He won't talk about the Apple because uh, you know he did what he thought was the right thing, and then got yelled at by the anti-nuclear movement. <clears throat> so you know, he got, he he was party to the deal that would shut the Apple in 25. Uh, uh, when they when their license is done, 
but um, uh, he won't entertain talking about shutting it earlier, which, you know, I'm terrified. We're all terrified. Right. 2019, so we got six more years, and, uh, you know, who knows when those earthquake faults are going to go off. I mean, it's not a and, matter uh, of if, it's a matter of when. That You were exactly right. So what's happening now is uh, we have discovered uh, uh, one of the groups that was a party to the deal to shut down in 2025, a group called Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility. has a very good lawyer named John Geisman, who was involved in the uh, Public Utilities Commission, you know, with, under Jerry Brown. And um, he has just filed a brief, which is really looking, worth looking at. Go to the Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility website, A4, mm -hmm. the number NR.org, um, <clears throat> pointing out the incredible co uh, cost of continuing to run Diablo. I mean, it's, it, literally, they will uh, uh, overmarket this year uh, almost $530 million. And that's charitable. I mean, That's every nuclear keep. power plant. I think every every time I've talked to anybody about a nuclear facility, it seems to, the complete disregard for fiscal responsibility or safety seems to be tantamount throughout the entire nuclear industry, anywhere I've looked in the last five years. In fact, in 2012 or 13, I think it was 13, mm -hmm. I was doing research for a college paper, and I found a, a scientific study uh, by a group of scientists in Spain, six scientists, turns out that the IAEA safety <coughs> culture model had never been empirically tested. It had eight markers of safety. So they decided to test it. They got a nuclear facility in Spain to test this safety model. On all of the markers except for one, they failed. And the one that they passed 50% was that the workers felt like they could talk to their employers about a problem that they saw on the facility. <clears throat> well, that wouldn't be true here in, in um, uh, California. I mean, you have um, a situation at Diablo where, you know, the NRC has site inspectors um, at every reactor. And the site inspector at Diablo wrote a memo saying, listen, I don't think that the, uh, I don't think this plant can withstand a credible earthquake. That's awesome. And uh, they, they totally trashed the guy and uh, sent him back to uh, North Carolina or, or, um, uh, you know, uh, back, back east, and uh, then uh, he's gone. He's no longer with the NRC. So they basically got rid they of somebody were, uh, who was doing his job accurately. Exactly. Wow. Because they can't handle, you know, the reality of it. Do you uh, know if the safety yeah. inspections at Diablo have been reduced since Trump has? I know that on um, Hanford, at the Hanford and all the legacy sites, they, the Department of Energy is now preventing the national, uh, I think it's called the National Offense uh, Oversight Board, from going on to the legacy sites without permission, and the employees are no longer allowed to talk to them. And I know it, that happened around the same time the NRC was told to reduce their inspections. Do you know if there's still inspections going on at Diablo? <coughs> Whenever a, uh, um, uh, an inspection comes up, uh, you know, a periodic inspection um, uh, comes up, uh, the company uh, asks the NRC for a variance or a waiver. Wow. And the, and the, and the commission does. I mean, there's a guy in Michigan, Michael Keegan, uh, who uh, tracks this stuff. And, um, you know, they, they, the, the commission, there are five commissioners on the NRC, and the the way it's set up is that the president appoints the five commissioners approved by the Congress. And um, when you have a Republican commissioner, a Republican president, you have three Republicans and two Democrats. When you have a Democrat, there's three Democrats and two Republicans. That's how we wound up with Greg Yasko for mm -hmm. a while under Obama. Uh, and they forced him out because he actually did his job. Right. And uh, so, like, like Michael Peck. So, um, you know, the, the commission, which was always a rubber stamp, um, has even less credibility now than, than, than ever. Wow. Well, listen. So, they're not, so the deal at, at Diablo did involve this, the town, the, the union. Uh, it was a complicated deal, but a good deal. And one of the great things, and, and to a certain extent, you know, we, 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 I supported the deal <clears throat> as an interim step to, you know, a quicker shutdown. Mm -hmm. And now, 
because of the changed um, economic situation, and, and this is critical, uh, A4NR, which was a party to the deal, is now asking that they shut earlier, which was always, uh, you know, allowed. And the reason that is that <clears throat> not only is the power from Diablo uh, insanely expensive, but it, it, um, it actually uh, is detrimental to the grid because, um, as you know, a nuclear plant is either up or it's down. You know, it's right. always that uh, if, it's, if it's operating, it's going to be operating, you know, to put large chunks of electricity on the grid. But the grid demand is, is fluctuates. Uh, it's just like anything else. And so when you have this lump of power from Diablo on the grid and demand sinks below what the grid is putting out there, they shut down the, the, the wind and solar facilities. And so you know, we're continually having situations where wow. uh, when demand drops, uh, they, they, because all this power from Diablo is out there, uh, they're, they're forcing these wind and solar plants to turn off. Wow. It's ridiculous. And so this, this whole crap that's being pushed by these, these clowns um, that nuclear power is somehow fights global warming is completely wrong. You know, all nuclear plants emit heat, they emit, emit carbon, and they emit, and emit radiation. And, and um, not only that, uh, they it, use a lot of fossil fuel after they're finished because it takes a lot of fossil fuel to maintain <clears throat> and deal with, you know, the ongoing issues of maintaining them. It's a it's from crazy. Well, also to, to create the, to create the, fu- the fuel, right? The enrichment, uh, right? Pro- so pro- the mining. the grave, they're completely, uh, they're completely not green at all. So. Well, exactly. Well, you guys have been listening. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission Radio Show. I want to remind you, and we're, my guest today is Harvey Wasserman. Yes. Harvey has a website, and I, and I forgot to mention it at the beginning of the of the uh, at the top of the hour. It's called Solartopia. I encourage everyone to go there. I'll have a link in, of all these things in our podcast notes, um, and that's where you can find his archives to his radio show. So I strongly suggest that you go there and. Harvey, I want to give you a little bit of time to talk about your book, uh, The People's Spiral of U.S. History. Right. So this is a a book I've been working on actually for 50 years. When I was a uh, grad student at history um, way back in the uh, late 60s, I came across a book called The Contours of U.S. History, uh, Contours of American History by a professor named William Appleman Williams. He was at uh, Wisconsin. And then, of course, uh, I read Howard Zinn's great stuff. And, um, there, I came up with a theory. Well, it was, it was, uh, Williams, William Appleman Williams' theory, um, that American history goes in cycles. And <clears throat> I changed, I, I worked with it and have, have turned it into something a little different, but I, I think, uh, and I, I actually corresponded with Professor Williams about it. I have, I actually have an archive at the University of Massachusetts and I have his letter in it along with a letter from Howard Zinn. And, um, uh, so I, I find over the past 50 years, I taught, uh, at two colleges in central Ohio for 14 years. <clears throat> this idea that, uh, U.S. history can be, um, dissected into six easily understood cycles. And, uh, I also came to believe and, and very strongly do, that actually American democracy derives uh, from the indigenous. Um, there were no countries in Europe and no move for democracy uh, that had anything uh, was in anywhere tangible on a scale uh, um, or depth that we saw in the Iroquois Confederacy. The Iroquois Confederacy was a, a, a congress of five tribes in what's now upstate New York, stretching from Albany across to Buffalo. It was the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Seneca. And they um, were always at war. And then a, a, a myth, a, 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 either a real guy or a mythological holy man came. His name was Daganawida, and persuaded the tribes to um, uh, stop uh, uh, killing each other and to form a congress, a, a, a confederacy. And the confederacy is extremely democratic. It's made matriarchy run by the women <clears throat> the men were the chiefs uh but the the women chose them and could remove them and i saw a documentary film they asked a, an iroquois woman 
uh, if the men, why is it that if the women run the tribes, the men are the chiefs? And she said, well, it gives them something to do, and it makes them feel important. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, you know, and uh, it was the, the, when the French uh, saw the uh, the French really loved the Iroquois. They loved the Indians, actually. Um, uh, they got along very. They, they had plenty of wars, but. They got along generally very well, and they were inspired by the Indians. And some of the Brits were, most of the Brits were, turned a real blind eye to the uh, to the indigenous and treated them, you know, like farm animals basically. But uh, a, a few of them, and most importantly, uh, Ben Franklin, understood how sophisticated and advanced uh, the uh, governmental system of the uh, Iroquois really was. He said that he he was quoted for a white man to say this was. Quite, but you know, quite revolutionary. But it was Ben Franklin, who, as far as I'm concerned, is the most important um, uh, figure in in Western civilization uh, in in modern times. Ben Franklin, he is an astounding individual, and uh, he basically said, and he was right, that the Iroquois Confederacy ran better than the British Parliament, and uh, and so he used that, as did Washington. Actually, um, Washington was an Indian killer, <clears throat> and, and um, but he. He also understood and respected because he fought against them uh, how advanced they were, and um, they used the Iroquois Confederacy as a model for the American uh, uh, Constitution. I mean, the whole congressional system is based on the Iroquois Confederacy, yeah. and American democracy, as far as I'm concerned, in, in my book, uh, the People's Spiral, is is rooted in the indigenous. And uh, so, what I posture, I posit that American culture. American history is based on a back and forth uh, dynamic between the very, very um, tolerant, you know, uh, gay friendly, um, uh, women matriarchal, uh, uh, one with nature. Uh, the Indians, the, no indigenous tribe understood had any concept of private ownership of land. I mean, they, the whole, right. um, the whole uh, stewardship. Idea. I mean, the Indians were, were came from them. They were basically culturally and spiritually uh, in, indivisible from nature, as opposed to the whites, especially the Puritans who came here with this idea that human beings were somehow separate from nature and should dominate and superior. And so the yeah. superior, yes, and to other and to other people. Right. Uh, you know, the Indians didn't have that belief, um, and you know there were uh, hundreds and hundreds of tribes, clans, nations. Confederacies throughout northern North America. There were no cities except for one uh, a fairly large uh, town uh, on the Mississippi River near um, uh, St. Louis called Cahokia. Uh, unlike the Aztec and the Inca, uh, the um, you know the North America was just basically villages and uh, and communal groups. So the idea of my my vision of American history. In the people's spiral, is that it's a back and forth dynamic between the indigenous and the and the and the Puritans, who are are male dominated, technological. You know, the Indians did not advance develop advanced technology because they they didn't believe uh, they, they had no sense of dominating nature. They were master agrarians. I mean, the, the nobody was a better farmers uh, in the history of the world than the indigenous. Right. Uh, and you had you had. Communities, villages in um, in the Iroquois country, that where they had six square miles of corn. I mean, you know, and they, also the, the they and they also had different kinds forest. of corn. You know, it wasn't just like one type of corn. There was like a a lot of different kinds of potatoes and a lot of different kinds of corns that have just gotten right. homogenized in the modern era for simplicity's sake. So that, you know, they could uh, mono mono farm. Or I mean, right? They also didn't they didn't keep animals. Right. Um, they 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 manipulated the forest. They they actually got rid of the trees. They girdled the trees that they didn't want, and they promoted the trees that were productive for for fruit, for vines, for uh, medicine. Uh, you know, aspirin comes from willow bark. Right. Um, uh, the the whole uh, medicinal um, uh, range they had was all plant based. They pra- they did practice abortion. Um, uh, women, as I say, dominated the tribes. And um, uh, I'm not going to say it was paradise, but they they, uh, they they had plenty of wars and things like that. Uh, but there was no class system. 
And there was uh, also no real slavery, and the, you know, like they did take slaves, but people were expected to leave. You know what I mean? They or they traded them back or whatever. You know, when they well, had the women and the children, women and children that were captured in battle, they they integrated. Right. And then the men, uh, the, the Iroquois, in, in some cases, you know, if you were really really brave and if you were captured, they basically they ate you. So that 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 stuff the Iroquois, the current Iroquois, are you know are remorseful about. Let's put it that way. So, but um, uh, they were and remain incredibly advanced. I mean, the indigenous are still very much at the heart of the environmental movement That's in this true. country. Well, they and, need and, to be because we, most, six, more than sixty percent of the uranium mines are on their lands. So they, you know, they have been dumped on the the greatest. I mean, right. they have been grotesque. It's I, I consider the nuclear industry to be an assault. It, it is really literally a battery of of our nation i mean we're the only nation that actually bombed our own land and then they dug up all the dirt and brought it to the marshall islands and that's its own little story that's a catastrophe so it's well the french the french the french the russians the brits um india uh probably israel uh, pakistan they've all exploded nuclear weapons on their own land and uh it's not it's not a pretty picture we of course led the way, but and and, the, and then the Russians, the Soviets uh, came right away, and so it's not. But nuclear nuclear power and weapons are not just um, uh, an assault; they're, they're but suicide. But the Brits didn't. The I mean, Brits, the, all those other nations didn't bomb their own nations where they lived. They bombed their territories, right? Uh, I, yeah. So we brought it back. Well, except for the Russians, right? I mean, except because the Russians to, uh, just so gigantic. They just you know like it's. Right. Is, we brought it back to Nevada. That was that's, exactly. We, we started in the in the South Sea. I mean, we started in Japan. Well, actually, no. The first the first uh, nuclear bomb was exploded in New Mexico. Right. Uh, in July in July of uh, 1945. Then we did two in Japan. Then we went to the South Pacific. But in '52, we brought it back to Nevada. And, and I that, actually that, and that, I that, actually consider the nuclear waste to be sort of like little nuke bombs. You know what I mean? Like Chernobyl went up in smoke, but I know for a fact, like every one of those canisters, every one of the storage tanks, they have a thousand Chernobyl, enough cesium-137 in all of them. And they all leak. I mean, thanks to the work of Donna Gilmore, we now know that the whole tech canisters that we store our nuclear waste in start leaking at 20 years. Most of the waste has been in there for 13 years, 13 to 15 years, and some of them are at 18. And we are going to start seeing, it's going to be like popcorn. They're just going to start popping you know i mean i have a sense of urgency that's why i do this podcast i have a sense of urgency to want people to understand and i didn't play my intro because we're pre-recording this but in my intro i say that happiness is resistance i want to be able to bring this out of the closet so that we can talk about it without being fearful most people shut down because they're so afraid of it but my thesis is is that there's a lot to live for. We, the, you know, just because we're in the stew, the nuclear stew, doesn't mean that our lives are miserable and we're all going to die and get sick. And I mean, we are we are going to have a lot more death and cancer and illnesses. That doesn't mean we cannot thrive and have a magnificent life. You know, some people will get sick quickly. Some children will have birth defects. But we can manage our lives as human beings and still face this horrible thing that has been basically shoved in the closet by every industry and every segment of society. Well, not every segment. We've had uh, um, opposition, and that's part of the cyclist theory, is that uh, you have a, uh, w the way it works is this. You have a period of, uh, of materialism and decay, and it starts in the 1680s, um, and, and, and when we, you have a glorious revolution, an uprising in England that affects us here, and then uh, here in the, in, in America, uh, the whites overthrew their colonial governments um, uh, along with the overthrow of uh, James II in England, and uh, you start uh, then you have a, a period of green, a springtime uprising where things like environmental and nuclear issues are dealt with, and people do rise up, and it's a, a, an arising and awakening <clears throat> of spiritual. Feminist uh, music, uh, sexual um, uh, cultural upheaval, and political upheaval for equal rights, uh, often race based. And that happens in America in the 1730s and 40s. You have the Great Awakening 
uh, a spiritual uprising um, in which actually blacks and women participated, mm. and uh, the uh, the fight, uh, John Zanger's fight for freedom of the press, and that leads into a hot summer from a springtime into a summer of of conflict, uh, resolution, and war. In this case, the revolution. Uh, then it's always followed by a a um, an autumn, a fall of reaction after mm. the um, <clears throat> um, revolution. Uh, we had the coming of the Constitution. I am not a fan of the U.S. Constitution. I love the Bill of Rights. I think the the First Amendment is actually the greatest single sentence ever written. Uh, Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion and so on. Um, but you do have the uh, retrenchment of the uh, rich white planters um, and bankers sure. and in the, in the U.S., followed by a winter of materialism and decay. Where, you know, we had the era of good feelings, we had Jefferson's presidency and Madison and where people just kind of forgot about any kind of progressive politics and, and, uh, just wanted to basically consolidate their fortunes and get rich. And now that breaks down. There's always an economic crash. In this case, it's in 1819. Um, and then you have the coming of a strong, somewhat, well, allegedly progressive leader, although in this case, Andrew Jackson was a horrible racist pig really our, our second worst president, as far as I'm concerned. Our worst president, by the way, <laughs> by far, worse than Trump and worse than Nixon, was Woodrow Wilson. And, and he, he was an incredible reactionary. He, he killed the um, socialist movement literally by force <laughs> and loved the Ku Klux Klan and got us into a world war, <clears throat> which he used as a cover to destroy the radical labor movement. Uh, but anyway, so mm-hmm. after um, this era of good feelings, you you have a uh, uh, a thaw, a, a crash. Jackson comes in. There's a whole upheaval. Um, um, uh, you have a transcend in springtime. You have a transcendentalist movement again. Great literature, the arts, uh, women's rights, um, a sexual revolution. Um, you even had hippie farms back in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, where everybody swept together. There was one. There was one hippie farm where uh, the guy who was sort of the principal figure kept written uh, a written log of everybody who slept with everybody. Wow. <laughs> and then he had to, he had to leave town for, <laughs> as you might expect. So, um, uh, and then you have the rise of the abolitionist movement. It leads to the civil war, the hot summer of conflict. We do abolish slavery. And, uh, and then of course there's a reaction there. Uh, the, uh, Congress run by radical Republicans attempts to reconstruct the South but the South rises, the Ku Klux Klan comes up, you have an intense uh, reactionary period in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s where the corporations essentially take over the country. There's another crash in the 1890s. You have the rise uh, 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 of uh, a springtime of the socialist and, and bohemian movements, uh, another cultural upheaval and radical uh, left politics trying to get social justice. Unfortunately, it's crushed by Woodrow Wilson, who comes in in 1912 um, and, and gets us into World War One, which was vastly opposed by the majority of the right. people in the country. And he uses World War One, which was actually uh, just a complete lie. Everything about it was a lie. Right. And uh, uses that as cover to destroy the socialist movement. You know, most people uh, in the United States assumed we would eventually have a socialist uh, president. We had a wonderful leader named Eugene V. Debs. He was uh, pop- widely loved everywhere. Uh, Wilson threw him in prison and used a, a fascist Gestapo to essentially destroy the Socialist Party. And then in the, you have the, the winter again in the 1920s. That breaks down in 1929 with the Great Crash. In comes uh, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt <laughs> with the New Deal, a very socialistic, progressive, you know, had limitations, but uh, it did a lot of good. Uh, happy days were here again, all that stuff. And uh, the Roosevelts were extremely progressive. Eleanor Roosevelt in particular, I think, is the most important female in, in world history in many ways. I mean, she was just an extremely um, uh, uh, progressive uh, social justice-oriented, uh, culturally advanced, uh, may have had, uh, you know, several uh, female lovers uh, as time went on, um, and set the stage for the, um, the United Nations. Uh, you have World War II, of course, uh, another hot summer uh, of, hmm. uh, uh, of social upheaval, followed by the uh, uh, another fall 
reaction with the uh, McCarthy era and uh, the anti-communist uh, uh, House on American Activities Committee, all that stuff. And then it breaks down in 1957. Uh, you have, uh, while Eisenhower is the president, you have a recession. And the cycle starts again in 1960 with John Kennedy, uh, a mixed bag in the beginning, but Kennedy very quickly evolved. I think uh, John Kennedy, had he lived, would have been a truly, truly great president. And, so um, would you he say- was... But, would you say that now with Trump we're in the in the darkness, like we're in the in the winter? Yes. Well, the, tr- or are Trump, we in the, the hot the thing summer? That's going on, no, no, no. The thing that's going on with the um, uh, this this time period, and uh, basically the cycles end uh, in 1992. Uh, mm-hmm. The American uh, democracy, uh, essentially as we knew it, essentially ends in 1992 with the Clintons, because Clinton comes in and he should have been a burst of energy. Uh, you know, another uh, springtime uh, upheaval. But in fact, if you look at uh, his his uh, administration, which I did, he accomplished absolutely nothing. There were no social programs. Right. There really, ha- we've had no social programs That's right. to benefit he, the he working sent middle us class. Way backwards. He was the uh, he was the Trojan horse for real. He really he sold, yes he he, 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 really he sold the Democratic horse. Party. Yes, he sold the Democratic Party to Wall Street. You know, he's right. he's now worth a hundred million dollars. And, you know, talk about Trump's corruption. I mean, it's the and, reason uh, why you know, we have Fox News. It's why we have a media that's controlled by just a handful of people. I mean, he is the, he's why we have the prisons for profit system. The, he's why we have the education for profit. I mean, the whole system, he upended everything. Yeah, the only uh, the only um, thing that built, well, he did one thing. He did broker a peace in Northern Ireland, uh, which was uh, a great accomplishment. Uh, other than that, he accomplished nothing. Uh, except to inaugurate a national debate on oral sex. That's that's Bill Clinton's great legacy. And then, of course, uh, in 2000, the, the election was stolen, uh, and the, the the corporate Democrats said nothing. I mean, basically, what happened in 1992 was that the Democratic Party was sold to the, to the corporations. Right. Whatever oppositional um, energy was involved with the Democratic Party disappeared with the Clintons. Yeah, you, you want to make the, the uh, Democrats mad. You, you start saying that the Democrats of today are Ronald Reagan Republicans, to be honest. They, that's how I feel about they them. Are. And yes, it, they oh, are. Oh, I've gotten some horrible flack from people. You know, people, I'm a, I'm a very big supporter of Bernie Sanders. I think that he could right the ship if, if the DNC would allow him to win the primary. I mean, but I'm, I'm not, a, I'm going to vote for Bernie, but I am not under any illusion. And I'm not, like I say, happiness is resistance. I am not going to let them destroy my happiness because the fascists control our nation, you know. Well, you got to remember also that Bernie is really just a New Deal Democrat. I mean, he calls himself That's socialist, right. but he's really not. That's right. And um, right. his politics are no, not 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 particularly. He's for a the Democrat, left and, actually. Right. He's what Democrats used to be, like for. Well, real. he's 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 from the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party, which was Paul Wellstone's uh, phrase, the senator from Minnesota. And I I knew Paul Wellstone, and I wow. happen to believe that it's very high likely. But he was murdered. I mean, one thing about this um, I agree with you. This book, I have a, at the end of the book, I have a section called Conspiracy Theories and Actual Conspiracies. And the reality is that every war that we've been in, the Mexican War, the um, Spanish-American, the First World War, um, the Second World War, the Korea, uh, Vietnam, uh, Iraq, all based on lies. All wars I mean, lies. You know, we were, I, we, we were never that's, attacked. That's right. But even attacking, being attacked... And creating a war is a lie. Like all wars are lies, in my view. I'm I'm very much. I do not. I think wars are lies. They destroy culture. Period. That's the goal of war, and make war profiteers very, 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 very rich. Well, they take the um, the progressive energies of the awakened spring times and turn them into armed, armed conflict. Right. And then the, you know there are allegedly some steps forward. I mean, during the Civil War, we did actually abolish chattel slavery. And it was a big deal. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, the two um, seminal presidents uh, uh, um, that we we looked to, Lincoln and Kennedy, uh, did not have second terms. So, it's, you know, unlike Franklin Roosevelt, we can we can evaluate Franklin Roosevelt. We knew who he was. We knew what he did. We knew what he believed. You can't do that for Lincoln and, and Kennedy. Uh, they, they brought certain beliefs into a certain framework. Um, you know, L- Lincoln made racist remarks. Um, uh, Kennedy, you know, was a cold warrior. 
but they both were, were killed uh, before they could really fully uh, um, mm-hmm. uh, put into effect um, their, their evolutionary beliefs. And the thing about both Kennedy and Lincoln is that they were extremely intelligent, and uh, they did have the capacity for growth, unlike, mm-hmm. say, Lyndon Johnson or, or even Bill Clinton. Right. I mean, Clinton, there's no evolutionary movement uh, from Bill Clinton. He should have resigned immediately when the Monica Lewinsky thing broke. Uh, Al Gore would have been president, and Gore, and we would have never had uh, George W. Bush, and probably not the Iraq War. It was all, and the, the you know Clinton's impeachment was well, all. I mean, about Al Gore him. gave us yeah. George Bush anyways. <laughs> he didn't fight, so you know what? Exactly. Uh, you know what, Harvey? We are at uh, 52 minutes. I think we should be ending here. I hope that I, I hope you will be kind enough to come back and visit our our program again because I really would love to talk to you about the weapons in space program. And, uh, you know, Carl Grossman wrote a book called Weapons in Space. And I, you know, this whole thing that Donald Trump created the Space Force is a misnomer. It's a complete lie. It has been, uh, it's an agenda that the U.S. military has been implementing for a long time and he's rolling it out. But I'd love to have your take on that. Um, but we are running short of time. And so I really appreciate well, you, can, you uh, coming with us. You can find show. my, uh, you can find my people's, his, people's spiral of U.S. history on my, website toortopia.org i've sent you a awesome. pdf and i look forward to your, your review and um we can talk about the spiral of history because basically uh the the u.s went brain dead in 92 and since the spiral stopped and um we are now completely integrated into the into the global economy and thankfully there are some countries that are making progress where we stopped um uh, germany the world's fourth largest economy is going 100% post nuclear right. uh with renewables and uh, denmark um right. uh other countries and are, america's are quickly Costa falling Rica. behind because of it too uh, harvey well, if you don't not, mind i yeah. will put the link to that pdf in the show notes on the podcast notes would you mind if i did that well, why don't you take a look at the book first and review it, and then okay. do that. And, and I will know. definitely okay? put the link to your website in our show notes so people can find you and start listening to your podcast because uh, your podcasts are really extremely informative, and it really they're inspiring. They help people get the courage up to start getting active because that's what we need. We need our listeners to take action on their own. So, Well, all the podcasts are at prn.fm, uh, progressiveradionetwork.fm. Um, and uh, you can go there. The, the whole, I've done several hundred of them. I know. And you can go there and listen and listen uh, very easily. Perfect. Well, thank you, Harvey, for joining us. And um, to my listeners, thank you for joining us. And as I say, put your courage feet on, and we will talk to you next week. Thanks for joining us, Harvey. Thank you. Mm. Thanks. Thanks okay. for having me. Thank you. Talk to you next time. Bye bye. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thank you for joining the Age of Vision radio show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We'll be back next week to bring you more information about the nuclear industry and the harm it's causing our planet and humanity. Find all of our podcasts on Spreaker.com or on YouTube at Nuts for Art, N-U-T-Z-F-O-R-A-R-T. Thank you for being part of the solution.